Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your marriage without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about how to use your feminine gifts in marriage, part two. My guest Tiana and her husband argued all the time about finances, parenting, home decor, in-laws. They even argued about things that they agreed on. But today she says big deals aren't such big deals anymore. And instead of arguing all the time, they're relaxed and lighthearted and teasing and laughing. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. The Worst Advice of the Week Award winner is from a student who sought support for her relationship and got a shocking response from a counselor. I'm going to let her tell you in her own words. All that is coming up, but first I'm going to talk about how to use your feminine gifts in marriage, part two. Sometimes when I'm talking to a woman who's struggling in her relationship and I mention feeling desired, cherished, and adored, she looks disbelieving. It's too pie in the sky for her. Sure, she wants him to stop playing video games all the time and take out the trash before it's overflowing and pay more attention to her. Or if her relationship is in a crisis, she wants him to stop sleeping in the spare bedroom or texting another woman or to move back home. But she can't imagine her man being tender and looking for ways to make her life easier and coming up behind her while she's cooking to kiss her neck. That seems completely unrealistic to her. That's because she doesn't yet know about her feminine gifts and how to access them. And last week in part one, I gave you a glimpse of how women have more power than men in relationships to avoid divorce and make their marriages last and thrive, including superpowers, number one and number two. So if you missed that, you might want to go back and listen to that first. And today in part two, I'm going to share superpowers number three and four. So number three, women have more power to make their relationships last and thrive because women are the keepers of the relationship. You can hear in every guest's story on this podcast who reports that as soon as she got some relationship skills and started using them in her marriage, it improved. And all she did was change her own mindset and her own behavior stands to reason that these women held the key to improving their relationships. Because once they understood their power and they knew how to use it wisely and they had the support they needed to do that, they got back to the important business of laughing together and enjoying more passion. We saw an interesting study that found that among women and men whose parents were divorced, only the women had a higher divorce rate themselves, not the men. But why? Well, if the keeper of the relationship doesn't have great intimacy skills, then it stands to reason that the relationship will flounder. So if a woman from a broken home follows the failed recipe for a happy marriage that she saw as an example, like I did for many years, then she would likely get the same sad results as her parents did. But the guy whose parents split up They saw no change in their divorce rate because they aren't the keepers of the relationship. Number four, women have the power to set the culture of the relationship. You know the expression, if mama's not happy, then nobody's happy? Of course you do, because that's what husbands swear by. They know it to be true. You have the power to set the culture for the relationship, to make it tender or tense or playful or practical or flirtatious or frustrating. I know, it's it's hard to believe. I didn't believe it either at first. I mean, most of us start out thinking what I used to think. I, I presume that if only my husband would change, then the relationship would get better. But my experience is just the opposite. You know, the change had to come from me the wife, the woman, it might seem like your guy is the one who needs to change. And if you're anything like me, you've already tried to help him improve, but it didn't help. So if your marriage feels lonely, distant, exhausting, maybe it's because no one ever taught you the skills you need to create a great relationship. And then how are you supposed to know them? 
And if you do know the intimacy skills, or if you've read about them or listened to all the podcasts, then you already know that you can improve your marriage starting today by practicing them, however imperfectly, just like the rest of us practice them imperfectly, including me. If you're struggling to apply them in your relationship, that just means you need more support. I also needed support to practice the skills. I still do. And that's why we have a worldwide community of women who are all committed to creating happy relationships and therefore stronger families. We all help each other to stay encouraged and inspired. It makes a big difference. And together, we've been able to end world divorce by making our own marriages last and thrive. And you can do the same thing by using your feminine powers. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. My guest Tiana and her husband argued all the time about finances, parenting, home decor, in-laws. They even argued about things that they agreed on. Add to that some financial pressure and issues with co-parenting with her husband's ex. And there was a lot of stress at her house. But after discovering the intimacy skills, she made one change that instantly cut their arguing in half and made her husband become more generous. Today, she says, when they do argue, things usually resolve quickly and big deals aren't such big deals anymore. And instead of arguing all the time, they're more relaxed and there's more lighthearted teasing and laughter. She's going to tell us what she did so you can do it too. Tiana, welcome to the Empowered Wife podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So I want to hear the whole story. What were things like for you in the bad old days? What was going wrong? Oh, um, you know, even just from the get-go, when my husband and I got married, we started arguing right away. And we're both very passionate people. So it's not terribly surprising that we both really wanted to stick to our guns about every little thing. So it wasn't terribly surprising to me, but what was hard was that I didn't know, I didn't know how to avoid an argument and I didn't know how to resolve an argument. And I didn't know how to be respectful before, during, and after an argument. And I, um, I just really didn't have the ability to have that respectful relationship with my husband that I so badly wanted to have. And like I said, it was just from the get-go, the arguing about everything. I mean, about what goes on the wall where. And I I remember one time he he bought something he wanted on the wall and he put it on the wall right by the back door, which is the door we used the most. It was the first thing you saw when you opened the door. And I was just livid that he would put something on the wall that I didn't want on the wall right there. And it was, I mean, it was a huge fight. It was a huge argument and I got my own drill out and I took it down. And, and that's, you know, one of the first things that sticks out to me as a silly argument that gets out of hand Mm -hmm. and it's, it's not a big deal where something is on the wall. But at that moment, I felt like I was not having the say in my home, looking how I wanted it to look. And so it was a lot of little arguments like that, but our days were completely peppered with them. It was constant. It was tense no matter what. Um, When we were getting along, it was for a very short period of time that we were getting along. And, you know, he had a daughter who turned three shortly after we got married. And for some reason, I thought that I would know more about taking care of a three-year-old, which (laughs) looking back is just not the case because she wasn't my three-year-old and I wasn't a mom 
before marrying and being a stepmom. So my perception of him as a father really needed some adjustment, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, we spent the first year of our marriage just fighting and longer than that too, actually. But we also were expecting our first child shortly after getting married. And that was very exciting, but also put this huge anxiety into me because I was, I was so anxious. I was so nervous and, you know, out of that nervousness and anxiousness just comes a bit more control when you don't know how to handle it. And I didn't know how to handle that nervousness, that worriedness. And so that didn't help either that I just turned to being more controlling. Um, you know, and the biggest the biggest issue that I think we fought about the most, especially during that first year, was money. Every little thing about money was a fight. How much we spend at the grocery store, which kind of cheese we're going to buy, what every little, every little detail where that money was spent was a fight. What kind of coffee we were going to buy? Were we going to grind our own coffee? You know, and it was just every purchase. And I felt like I was the one being controlled because I had gone from having my own job and living in an apartment and managing all of my own bills. And he had been living on his own, managing all of his own things. And I quit my job to move. And I felt like I didn't have any income anymore and that he was controlling all of our money. And that was a problem to me feeling like that, that I didn't have the flexibility to buy something at the grocery store that I thought we want, that I wanted us to have, that I thought we should have. So it was just constant arguments because how often do you shop? I mean, you know, every few days you're buying something. So the opportunity to argue about our money was daily. And I, I personally felt resentful of him buying things. I thought, well, now you just buy whatever you want, but if I want to buy something, I'm not allowed to buy it. And that's really how I felt in the, those moments. I can look back now and I see it differently, but overall, a relationship dynamic around money was very, very tense. And during our first year of marriage, we took a financial class together and I had in my head that we were going to follow all the rules in this financial class that we took. And that meant budgeting every dollar. And it meant putting our cash into envelopes all perfectly organized and recording all of our purchases. And this is how we were going to stay afloat. This is how we were going to pay our bills. This is how we are going to budget and be successful financially. And that was my, um, I was absolutely committed to doing that. And my husband took this class with me. We took it together. And he is not the rule follower that I am. He is the out-of-box thinker that I am. So he listens to this class and says, hey, this will work for us. This will work for us. This won't. Not going to do that. Um, but I looked at it very differently. I said, these are the rules. We will follow the rules. And part of the problem, too, is that conventional wisdom tells us in order to have a healthy relationship around money, that you both need to have an equal say and you both need to communicate very clearly and you both sit down and you go through your budget and everyone's needs are prioritized and that you have to have that structure and that communication to have a healthy financial relationship. And so that's really what I thought. And I was, I said, okay, we're going to do this. We are going to every week sit down and do our budget together. And it's probably no surprise that he didn't like that. <laughs> Shocking. What, what's not to like about that? But okay. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, so I pushed for that. I said, here's our budget sheet from our class. We're going to sit down and fill it out. <laughs> And I come from a teaching background. So this was oh. very up my alley and it was organized and there were straight lines and margins. And, um, and this was probably going to help you feel safe. It sounds like, right? Yeah. Like, oh, if we have all these envelopes with cash in them or whatever in this budget, then 
we never have to argue about coffee again, whether we're going to grind it or, or not. Uh, but it didn't turn out that way. It sounds like. No, not at all. It, it turned out into me dragging him to our, you know, weekly budget meetings, which, you know, I mean, (laughs) I think I could get him to sit down at the table with me for maybe like five minutes. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, gotta go. He would, he would just, he would just get up and walk away. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing? We're doing this together because that's what we're supposed to do. And, um, he said the envelopes wouldn't work for him. He said, it's not going to work because after work, I go shopping. I get tools I need. I get things for fixing our house. Um, and I want, I need to just be able to stop at Menards. So I'm going to be using the card. I'm going to do that. And I said, no, you don't have to do that. When you're done with work, just drive by the house. I will run the cash envelopes out to you because I'm so helpful. <laughs> and <laughs> I laugh about it now. And in that moment though, I really thought this was the right way to do this. And so we, we muddled our way through the envelopes for a few months. And, um, I also had that idea in my head because that is what my parents ended up doing and it worked great for them. So it it will work. This, this works, you know, seen it work. Yeah. Yeah. But we muddled our way through this and (laughs) I'm certain that he frequently just spent money on a card because, you know, he wanted lunch or he needed to get something, you know, but in my head, we were only using these envelopes. And also I didn't, I didn't know how much he was making each week because it, you know, it changed week to week and he had a really good idea of it. He knew what was in our account. I didn't know what was in our account. You know, I could have checked, but I think I just, in my head, I said, this is how much we're spending and we're just going to stay in it. So I'm, I'm applying this very rigid system and, you know, building, building some jail cells around myself for, um, how we're financially going to live together. And the one day that this broke really sticks out to me because I mean, things were tight, you know, it was, it was at times hard to make those bills, had hard to pay those bills, how hard to make those paychecks stretch then. And, I had at one point about $200 left in my envelopes spread out between different categories and it was going to last for the next two weeks because that's what we had budgeted. And I just remember my husband coming home and saying, someone is selling a sailboat, a little one to person, two sail, one to two person sailboat. And it's $200. I said, I have $200 for gas and groceries for the next two weeks because I decided that's what I had, you know, and it's in my envelopes and that's all I have for this. And he said, I'm going to go buy it. I'm like, there's no way you can go buy this boat. I have $200. You're going to take this $200 and go buy a boat. And he also already had one of these boats, but he wanted two. And he knew this was just a good deal. And he wanted two because he can take, you know, when we have our kids a little older, he can take them out sailing together on the lake. And that was going to be something special. And so he he said, I'm going to go get this. This is a good price for this. And he took my envelopes off the counter and he took every dollar out of every envelope and he went and bought this boat. And for me, that was absolutely crushing. I thought, who is this man who would not responsible. That's how I saw it. Yeah. I thought this is completely insane to do this. I can't even believe it. And I'm sure I said some terrible things to him in the process. And another way that I responded at that time, I packed his lunches for him. So for two weeks until we refilled those envelopes, I put rice and beans in his lunch. And that is all I put in his lunch. (laughs) That is all I put in his lunch. I love it. (laughs) No, I, I just, I just, Love you, Tiana, because I relate to you so much, right? We had the same kinds of struggles at my house. So I really (laughs) identify with everything you're saying. So you were going to save money by just giving him rice and beans because he had used all the, all the grocery money on this sailboat that you just didn't think we even needed. I know. I know. And at that moment I gave up, I said, I'm done trying to work on this money with you. I will not do it anymore. And, and things didn't get better after that. Actually, he spent money he wanted to spend. I resented him for it. I would 
go spend money that he didn't want me to spend and he would resent me for it. And that was kind of the system we got into. And it wasn't a great system. You know, it wasn't pleasant. We weren't getting along about our finances. There were a lot more arguments and, and that's about when, and this is still during our first year of marriage. That's about when I first picked up your very first book. And I'm like, I will read this. I will give it a try. And when I first read it, I thought, first of all, this woman is spying on us because she knows exactly what's happening in my house. How does she know we argued about that last week? Or, you know, it was just so spot on that I was just laughing. Like that is absolutely brilliant. And and she knows exactly what's happening here. And But then I read your advice and your suggestions and the skills and how they applied. And I thought that's also completely insane. I don't think I can do any of that. It was just, it was not natural to me, but at the same time, you were very convincing. And I thought, I will try it. I will try these things that do not seem like they jive with me at all because I can always go back to how things were. And let's say I do commit to doing this for two straight weeks, a hundred percent. Let's say I commit to that and it's awesome. Then that's great. I will keep doing that. And let's say I commit to that. Well, that, and it doesn't go well. Well, that was only two weeks. I will try something else. You know, it was an experiment. It was just an experiment. I love that. Exactly. Exactly. And the first thing I thought was this money thing has got to change. And I just, what I did was I just stopped trying to control it. All I did was I stopped trying to control my husband's management of our money. I didn't have to have a conversation. I didn't have to hand him the checkbook or anything because he wanted to manage it. He wanted to pay the bills. He wanted to put our money in wise places and take care of our family. And I was the one standing in the way of him doing that because I wanted it done my way. So after reading one of the chapters, I said, I will just stop doing that. And when he says, hey, um, I think we should get such and such, whatever you think. Or if he would ask me about purchases, honestly, I said a lot of the time, whatever you think. And then sometimes he went and bought something that I didn't want him to buy, but I kept my mouth shut and he paid all of our bills. He kept track of everything. He all of our fights, well, not all of them, but over half of them at least went away overnight because I just gave up the control of that. And, and that was such an eye-opening thing for me and such a relief to go days and weeks without fighting about money. And that was so inspiring to me. At that time, I was still kind of in a place where I didn't feel like I could purchase things either. And, and then as I was reading your book, I realized too, had I expressed to my husband a desire about anything, you know, I don't think I had, I think I reasoned my way through every discussion. Well, we should get such and such. And I have all these reasons supporting why, and that wasn't working because that's already stepping into an argument. And my husband is great at arguing. He loves to argue. So I, it wasn't, it wasn't a good way for us to function. So I was, this was the moment that I, I actively used another skill that really, really has stuck with me was I just, I wanted this robe. I was at the store and I saw this big luxurious robe and it's Midwest winter. It's cold. And I, um, was, very pregnant at the time. And I saw this robe and I thought, oh, that looks so comfortable, so luxurious. And I just would love to have something to wear after I have the baby and, you know, just all cuddled up with a baby in our winter house, you know, and just, it was a really sweet thought to me to get this robe and it wasn't on sale. It wasn't on sale. It wasn't on sale. (laughs) It was full price. How could you buy a full? Okay. But anyway, (laughs) <laughs> I know I know it was full price. And also I did have a robe. It just wasn't as nice as this robe. And so in my head, I was like, there's no way I could get this robe. And really in our relationship, 
it would have gone one of two ways prior to the skills. I would have not bought the robe and then resented my husband because I didn't get this robe. And then it would have come out in some explosion over me being upset about him buying something for himself. I'd say, well, you get that. I didn't even get a robe. And he would say, what are you talking about? What robe are you talking about? So that that would be one way. Or I would buy it anyway, just out of spite. And if I bought this robe out of spite, I would hide it from him. And I would only wear it when he's not around. So he wouldn't know that I spent money on a robe because he'd say, well, how much did that cost? And we'd have a whole conversation about it. So those were at the moment, my two options, because that's what I knew how to do until I remembered again in your book, a way to express a pure desire. And I thought, I really do just want this robe. That's why I want this. And I just pulled out my phone and I sent him a little text message. I said, Hey, I'd really love a new robe. There's one here. This is how much it costs. What do you think? And that was it. And he said, if you want that robe, I think you should go get it. Absolutely. And I was just floored. Who is that man that I just text? Because I didn't think that was my husband, but absolutely. He just, he said, absolutely go get it. Absolutely get it. And I walk out of the store with my brand new robe. You know, I'm so excited. And that was, it was a little thing and it really wasn't expensive, but for weeks, for weeks, he told me, I'm so glad you got that robe. Oh, I'm so glad you like that robe. And I still have that robe. And sometimes he'll still say, I'm so glad you got that robe you like so much. It's a little thing, but he was so happy that I wanted something and that he could provide that for me. And that's not something that we had ever had before. You found a third way. to I did. And it feels much better, it sounds like. Yes, I did. And and so that was kind of the beginning of our, um, you know, our working towards where we are today. And it's a constant process. It's a constant journey. But that was my very first practicing the skills. And, you know, there were a lot of ups and downs after that still even. But I think back to that when, when I'm not feeling great about our relationship, I think back to that and I go, what am I, you know, what can I do here? And also, man, my husband really wants me to be happy. Mm-hmm. and holding on to that. And that robe is getting a little tattered, but I'm going to have to hold on to it forever because it just <laughs> makes me so happy that I have something. And yes, that was years ago. He still tells me how happy that makes him that I have that robe. And I just feel very, I feel special just about that one little thing. And, and everything has just kind of flowed from that, you know? So while there were so many downs after that and so many fights still, I knew that these these skills were really going to work for me. So that two-week experiment, you kind of got your foot stuck in the door and couldn't keep going out. You couldn't say, oh, well, that didn't work. I'm going right. to just go back to the old way. You actually mm-hmm. have a lot of evidence that your, your happiness means so much to your husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And so, um, and I know it takes some courage, a lot of courage to just decide to stop controlling the finances. So that must've been scary, but it sounds like it brought a lot more harmony in your house. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and my husband is a wonderful provider. And when I think back to having money in envelopes, it just makes me laugh because (laughs) he's not that guy. It sounds like that's not what he wants. He's incredibly responsible with what we have. And so it just, it kind of makes me laugh at myself. And I'm, I'm proud of the growth I have as a wife in regards to our money management. You know, years after my kind of experiment is when I finally joined your program. And that is really when I saw even more, more growth because, you know, throughout the years we had had so so many arguments and they were less often since I wasn't trying to be controlling of the finances. They were a lot less often, but they were still hard to get a handle on. And I wanted to be able to have this harmonious marriage. And I wanted my kids to have that example. And I wanted them to grow up in a house where we're getting along. So, you know, throughout those years, we had some marriage counseling here and there. 
And um, you can imagine how well that goes with someone who doesn't want to sit and have a budget meeting. Um, you know, driving across town to meet with a counselor was not a great idea either. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, that interested in that, it sounds like. No, not at all. And I've, I've heard other women on your podcast say the same thing, but we just fought the whole way there. We fought the whole way back. (laughs) You know, we would drive separately sometimes because we just couldn't. And um, it wasn't helpful for us as a couple. There were a few things I took out of it for myself when I ended up going by myself because he wouldn't come, you know? So, but then I think, well, then why are we both going in the first place? Because maybe I'm the one that just needs some guidance here, you know? So there were a lot of tools I took um, Mm -hmm. from occasionally that I was able to take from these counselors, but as a couple, it was not as helpful for us as we imagined it may be. And, And yeah, so it was years after my experiment that we first tried that I decided to do the Your Diamond program. And that was a whole new world for me because up until that point, I knew that self-care was one of the skills. And I know that it's the first skill, but I really felt that I did not need that because I stay at home. I stay at home with my kids and I don't, I don't need to do self-care because I'm, I'm not getting up at six in the morning and you know, spending all day at a job. I'm, I'm working at home with my kids. And so I didn't need that. But once I started the program, that was the first thing I had to do was that self-care. And it just made a world of a difference. And within two weeks of that, two or three weeks of that, I thought, well, my life is completely different now. It is absolutely different. And I was so fond of my husband. I thought, oh, I just love spending time with you. And, you know, three weeks earlier, I didn't want to be in the same room as him. And so we're getting along and we're not fighting and I'm happy and pleasant. And, and then I think I sort of fell, I must've slightly fallen off the bandwagon with self-care because I remember very distinctly waking up one morning and being bothered by my husband next to me and his breathing. (laughs) And that day it was just like, he was a different person. I felt like he was a different person because we were not getting along at all. But I think I maybe had a meeting with my coach at this time and he obviously didn't change. Like my husband wouldn't have changed overnight. Does a husband become a different person from one day to the next? No, they don't. Right. Um, So that was kind of my wake up call that maybe (laughs) it's, it is me. It is me. It is my self-care. And he didn't change overnight. I stopped doing what I need to do to make myself happy. And now I need to start doing that again. And I did. And, you know, wouldn't you believe it? He turned back into the husband that I was so fond of. Over, you know, <laughs> crazy. You know what, though? I love about this story that you were enormously accountable, which I love about you, Tiana. But it sounds like what you realized is his breathing bothering me might be on my paper and not his, right? You, you got that awareness. So it's, it's actually very empowering to the day that that happens. Is that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That, you know, learning to take accountability for your own emotions and at the same time, honoring them. It's not something that I knew how to do naturally. So yeah, that was a, that was a wonderful realization for me. You know, it's not, it's not that we're incompatible because that's not the case. It's that I need to do what I need to do to make myself happy. And what does that look like for you? It changes day to day. It really does. I have my list, but sometimes I'll look through my list of self-care items and nothing sounds good. Well, that none of that sounds good right now. I'm going to have to come up with something else. And another thing that I learned along the way was that the traditional self-care items are usually, usually things that you go do on your own. And I do love being on my own, but we have, we have four young children right now, five and under, and I, I love being with them. It's, it's a challenge some days, but I do feel 
better when my self-care also has to do with them. I enjoy it more. Sometimes my self-care is doing a puzzle with my five-year-old. And I love that. And sometimes it's playing bingo with them all or something little and silly like that. But to take the pressure off myself that the assumption that you have to leave in order to get your self-care, that you have to go somewhere or that you have to be alone. And that can be really challenging for me to be able to get. And so the effort I put in to find a babysitter and to get everything set up and to leave to enjoy a one hour pedicure was just not worth it for me. I do like getting pedicures, but it's not something I'm going to regularly do in order to get my self-care. So my self-care, like I said, it has to do with what I can do at home. And sometimes it's reading a book to my kids um, when I should be doing the dishes, you know, or something like that. And it, so yeah, it looks very different for me than I would have thought it looked. What's a good example of you being the expert on your own life? right? And having to decide, okay, what's going to serve Tiana best for somebody else? Maybe it is getting that sitter and getting the pedicure, but for you, it's the bingo and reading the books to the kids. And, and it doesn't, it sounds like you're able to be very attentive to your needs, even with your four kids there, Mm -hmm. which is, that's impressive. Actually. I think I hear a lot of moms wanting a break from the, it's a job, right? That you're on 24 seven. Absolutely. But, and it sounds like for you that that wasn't really serving you. Right. It wasn't. And, you know, I, I think if I'm going out once a week to do something on my own, that's almost too much for me. It doesn't serve me. So mm-hmm. part of my self-care too is doing a bit less. It's taking things off of my plate. It's not necessarily volunteering somewhere that maybe I want to volunteer even but it's just too much. I just can't make it happen. And I'm happier when I'm able to lean into my job as a mom at home right now. So, um, I've really enjoyed that. And it's, you know, things like that too have helped my relationship with my kids because how much, you know, it's easy for resentment to build up when you feel I should be able to get out and do something. And then you aren't able to, but when you change your thinking to, well, how can I get my self care with these circumstances, then you just start enjoying where you're at. And so that was, that was a really good change for me. I really love that. Like your happiness is, it's not dependent on your circumstances at all. You can make yourself happy anyway. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. That's inspiring. Find a way. So what is your relationship like now? Yana? Now there's a lot more peace. There's a lot more peace and um, small arguments that come up because they still come up and they don't seem as big of a deal to me. And they don't seem like, hey, this is the end because we're having an argument and, and it doesn't feel end to me. It feels like, hey, maybe I need to take a step back. Maybe I have something to apologize for, which is very frequently the case. And being able to do that um, and being able to take a look at our relationship as a as a whole and as those little fights, just something to work through and that I have the skills to be able to improve on, that's a huge change. And that's something that I really, really appreciate about the skills that I have a better a better perception of what our relationship is and what it looks like. So now nowadays, you know, I keep my mouth shut if my husband is bothered by something because it's on his page. And that, that in and of itself is huge because that is his right to be upset about something. And he, he can have whatever emotions he has. And it's not my job to police them. And it's not my job to teach him how to handle anything better. And when I really view myself as his wife and not someone who's supposed to teach him anything. It really just improves everything because he can handle it. And, you know, just this morning, there was the opportunity to have an argument that a few years ago, I would have dove in and told him, you shouldn't feel this way. 
about this. You're overreacting. I, I would have dove in and said those things. And instead, I just listened to him. And I said, I hear you. And I went and I did some self-care that I could think of. And I think I sat with some coffee, just, you know, stepped out and sat with some coffee. And I tell you, within five minutes, he said, I'm really sorry about, you know, I'm sorry about getting upset about this. You know, thank you for understanding how I'm feeling. And it was just, it was just a non-issue. And that's not something I knew how to do before the skills. I didn't know how to allow someone to really be responsible for themselves either. So that's been a huge change. You know, our, our arguments and fights that we have now, I can't even really identify, oh, oh, you know, I can't say, oh, well, we tend to argue about this. Like, I don't even think there is something that continually comes up that we always argue about because it's just so short-lived and we just kind of get right past it. And that is, that is a huge difference for us. That is amazing. And I love hearing that he apologized to you. Is that, was that happening before? No. Okay. No. Um, and I think also it might've happened occasionally and my response wasn't at all gracious. Mm. My response would have been you know, just digging in more and starting a bigger fight instead of really accepting his apology. And, and so that's been huge too, that when he apologizes, I, I just accept his apology because he, he means it and he is apologetic and it's a non-issue. So, you know, that's, that's a huge change. That is a huge change. So you've become, it sounds like, um, I want to say there's like an emotional maturity in you. Maybe that wasn't there before. Is that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I would say that's pretty accurate. I obviously, if you're, if you haven't had a successful marriage, marriage is new to you. You know, you don't know exactly what that looks like. And I just, I didn't have the ability to just um, test different things out until I found something that worked. Like it was just, I felt like I was just floundering and I felt like the more conventional wisdom I looked at, the worse things got. And it would just, it would bother me because advice would say, well, have you tried to sit down and talk about how you feel and express yourself and just tell him how that makes you feel? And I thought these women have no idea what it is like to, for that, not like, that's not something that ever helps. And now instead, I I have different skills. I can say, oh, I'd really love such and such. And sometimes that happens, you know, and sometimes it doesn't. And, but it's me just, this is what I want. And my husband can hear that. And he is a very smart man too. And he, I don't have to tell him if he's hurt my feelings because he knows and he really doesn't do it very often anymore. And when he does, I just, I say, ouch. And he, and then we, you know, generally have a little bit of space. And then I usually get an apology. And even when I don't get an apology exactly, I'm still able to forgive him and move on because I told him I was hurt and because he doesn't want me to be hurt. And because he's, he's just a good man and he's a good husband. So that ability to have those arguments in our marriage um, without letting them make me feel like, oh no, we're going to get divorced because of all these fights we're having. You know, I don't, I don't feel that way. I feel really empowered that we can, we can handle anything in our marriage. That is awesome. It's inspiring to hear <laughs> the way you speak of him as such a smart man and a good husband. You sound very respectful of him. And maybe that was a strength of yours already. I think that you very clearly outlined what respect looks like. Not, it wasn't in a convoluted way. It said, this is what respect looks like. And I thought, well, no one's ever told me that before. So, I mean, I was attempting to be respectful, but I had nowhere to start. I had nowhere to go. I was just trying to, um, I think helpful too. I also thought maybe helpful was respectful, which it's not. And, 
And so just being able to respect his thinking and respect his decision-making skills by not arguing with them. And really that's, that's had such wonderful results for me in our marriage because he really does make great decision and great decisions. And he handles situations really well. And, um, and he knows, I think that, cause I do tell him that a lot. There are so many times that there's a situation that just really stresses me out. And I think I just like, I can't deal with this. This is a problem. And if I tell him this is really bothering me and I can't deal with it, well, it's, he immediately takes it right off of my plate. He's like, oh, I'll handle it. And he handles it, you know, 10 times better than I would in those moments where I'm feeling very upset. And, and I love that he does that for me. That makes me feel really taken care of. And I'm able to put more of my efforts into things I really want to, and my emotional effort into our home and our children and our our marriage. And I don't have to worry about those things that were causing me stress. Fantastic. So how has this affected your kids? They're pretty little still, but do Mm -hmm. you think there's been an impact on them in any way? Oh, I, I think absolutely. Um, I have little children that adore their daddy to (laughs) their love knows no end. Like they are just enamored with him and rightfully so. And he is so good with them and so patient. And um, we've kind of found that the two-year-old age is very, it's very hard for, it's the hardest age that we have found. And so being home all day with our two-year-old is usually a challenge. And he is always so hands-on, like he comes home and he picks the two-year-old up and just helps take care of him and helps guide him and teach him. And it's, it's more than a full-time job that he's doing with our kids, um, on top of his job. And, and so I'm really grateful for that. And I know that they, I know the kids see us get along better and, you know, if he'll give me a kiss in the kitchen, they just kind of giggle. And that's a good thing for kids, you know, to see that mom and dad love each other and to hear mom and dad speak kindly to one another. And that was so important to me. I really, that was probably one of the driving points behind me really wanting to take our marriage, do the best we can with it. So that, yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that they're able to have a different perspective of marriage now. And of course it's a constant journey too. Like I know that I'm going to continue working on these things and we're going to have ups and downs, but I am also very confident that they are going to be able to grow up in a house where mom and dad um, really love each other. It's, uh, it sounds, it makes me just feel so warm and fuzzy hearing about your family life because it sounds like what everyone dreams of having. Yeah, it, it is. And it was my dreams. Like, that's what I wanted when I was, you know, I, when we got married, I wanted this happy family. And I felt like those dreams were just slipping out of my fingertips by the day, you know, we were expecting our first baby and we were fighting all the time. I thought, where is my dream? And now I think, well, this is great. This is, this is what I wanted. There are stressful times. It's not, you know, it's not all roses at all, but it is still what I absolutely love. And I'm so grateful that my um, desires in raising our kids are so important to my husband. And, and honestly, there are so many, so many parenting decisions that come up constantly. And once I was able to really realize that, and you said this in one of your books that I will never, I personally, me. I will never be as good of a dad as my husband is. And just that one, I think it's just one sentence and just understanding that really has transformed how we, how we parent together because I'm not a dad and I don't know the best way to be a dad because I'm not one and really in a way humbling my own opinion of how things ought to be for my husband's thinking and his natural abilities to father our children. And, and so even with all of those little opportunities 
to argue about little parenting things. We don't really have those because he's a dad. He has his dad perspective. And when I, as a mom, want want something like, oh, I, I want us to spend time together after church on Sunday. Well, then usually we go for a hike or we go for a picnic or we have a special lunch or something sweet like that. And it's not, it's not an arguing about what we're going to do on Sunday afternoon. It's just, I would love some family time together. And sometimes it's, I would love a break. (laughs) And, and he always hears that too. And, um, so my children are, they're still growing, you know, and they're still have many years ahead of them before they're adults. But I, I do know that we are on such a good track for making a foundation for them for what a marriage looks like. Yeah, it must make, make you feel really good that you can be the role model to them for what's possible in a marriage. They're getting that good foundation that so you're passing it on to the next generation. Yeah, and that can last many generations. Just yeah. one good, solid, healthy marriage can be taught to your children and their children. And it's, it's really something that I think I, as a mom can hand down to future generations. So much, so moving. It's a, it's very exciting actually, because uh, you've made your marriage a priority. You've made fixing it a priority, getting it to be harmonious and respectful and sweet and loving and uh, I just think the world needs more women like you, Tiana, that, that make it that priority. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What's your tip for a woman who's listening right now and feels like you did where you just argued all the time um, over every everything? And she wants what you're describing now where she feels like her husband wants to make her happy and he's showing up as a great husband and a good dad. And what would you suggest that she do? Um, one, read your books because there are so many instances of control that I really didn't think were controlling. And so to be able to have my eyes open to that was huge because I didn't think of myself as a controlling person. Um, I thought of myself as type A and organized, but I didn't think of myself as controlling. And so to be able to understand a bit more how my husband is feeling about it without him having to tell me because I can't imagine him saying, Hey, you know, that little thing you did, that was really controlling to me. Like he's not going to communicate that to me. He's going to let it go and move on, but it's still going to bother him. So being able to have my eyes open. So I would, I would suggest to read your books because they are so helpful. I keep one by my bedside table and try to reread it you know, just pick it up here and there as much as I can. And that's one, but also it's when you're fighting all the time, someone has to put their sword and shield down. Someone has to do it. And, and who cares who does it? It doesn't matter who puts their sword and shield down first, because your end result is that harmonious marriage that you want. So who cares who, who cares? It doesn't matter. Just choose to do it because if you can, it's well, well worth the results. Oh, you're a great example of that. What do you think you would say to Tiana if you could go back and tell her what you know now? Um, I think I would say that your husband really wants you to be happy and to trust him Mm. and assume the best. Trust him, assume the best. He really wants you to be happy. Have you ever, has he ever said anything or sort of validated your, the changes in you to make you feel like how he really sees the difference? Um, not directly. No. And, and I don't expect that. I don't, I don't necessarily need that. And I don't know if he would have a specific example just in a Oh yeah, things are really great. And that would kind of, (laughs) and that's enough for me. Um, But one thing, you know, when I talked to him about doing the podcast, he said, Oh, are you, are you going to say, you know, mean things about me or awful things about me? And I said, no, there's, there's nothing for me to say. And he's like, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, I'm going to talk about 
what a great wife I am. And he just burst <laughs> out laughing. And because <laughs> I just <laughs> And, you know, it was a conversation after that. He just laughed and we just tease each other a little bit. And, and that was that. So, I mean, that for me is enough acknowledgement. You know what? I absolutely love that because um, this is a victory lap. It's a time for us to celebrate your tremendous accomplishment, Tiana, and being a, becoming a great wife. You studied, you worked at it, you practiced. And now you are uh, a great wife. And even though he laughed, um, I think he agrees. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why it's funny. And uh, so I do want to just give you this wife award, you know, like, here you go. <laughs> For really creating a, a wonderful family and just uh, bringing love into the world in a way that's uh, very tangible in your home. So congratulations to you. Thank it's you. Super inspiring. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing all the details with us. It's thank you so much. Really wonderful to hear. Thank you. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. And now it's time for the worst relationship advice of the week award. It's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice. Yeah, it's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice of the week. And the advice that's got me distressed this week is from a student who was seeking help for her marriage from a counselor. So first of all, I want to give a warm shout out to this student who spotted the terrible relationship advice herself under difficult circumstances. I'm going to share it in her own words. She writes, quote, I went to a counselor recently and asked for some tools to work better with my husband. And after 30 minutes of questions without meeting my husband during my first meeting with her, she recommended I get out of my relationship fast that I was with an abuser, that I was in trouble and had to watch myself. Then she went on to state her credentials about her 20 years of working with abusive males. And although they can be naughty, they are really quite nice people. She writes, I was astounded, aghast, and a bit WTF thrown in for good measure. And when asked if I wanted to rebook, I politely declined. My husband is hardworking and inspirational, she adds, and um, he has never, ever showed signs of abuse. She also says, thank you for your podcasts. I enjoy them in my travels and have passed them on to my girlfriends. So uh, great. Thank you for nominating this bit of worst relationship advice for this week's award because it is a clear winner. Ding, 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 ding. And kudos for being the expert on your own life and not falling for this so-called expert advice on how to break up your family. And thanks for your generous contribution to the podcast, which makes me feel warm and fuzzy. So for obvious reasons, the advice to get out of your relationship fast, you're with an abuser, is the very, very, very worst relationship advice I have heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll share how to know what you're feeling at all times. And in the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that when I have to take off my Fitbit to charge it, I think now I'm walking around taking all these steps for nothing. Nothing.